Hi there, I'm Dave Butler. I'm Grace Freeman. Welcome to your Book of Mormon class today, this week, whatever it is for you. We're so happy that you're here. If you're just joining us for the Book of Mormon year, we're, this is our third lesson. We're three lessons in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go back and catch up if you want or start right here and just jump in because the story is just getting going and we'll catch you up. Which You'll is, be fine. Yeah, it's just going to be great. So um, the one thing that you do want to know, though, if you're just barely starting with us is... Um, well, we'll talk about it when we get to it. I was going to show the poster, <laughs> but then I thought, oh, well, okay. It's fine. It'll we'll come just up. talk about when we get to it. Any of the, we'll talk about everything right when we get up with it. Let's just jump in. It's and more then fun we'll that catch way. up. Yeah. It's exciting. Uh, yeah. It's super fun. All right. Today we are in 1st Nephi 6 through 10. Uh, what we're doing on the video is we're dividing it up into um, five, six. Six. Six different segments. And they're divided up as your daily reading. You may have seen this. I, oh, let me start this clock. So we are... <laughs> I'm so shaky when I push that for some reason. Um, uh, six of your... The, the reading is divided up into six different days in case you are trying to do a Monday through Friday and then a weekend section. And so that's how the video is going to be divided into each of those. The reading's already been divided for you. Just so you know, you can check our Instagram weekly and it'll show you the breakdown for um, what you could be reading each day if you wanted to get through it. The weekly reading was done already by Come Follow Me. They already divided that out. And then we've just done the daily reading divided out for you. So the weekly reading is the one that everyone's on schedule with and the daily we divided out. Or if you have your Read It, Live It calendar, you can get this at Desert Book, by the way. It's got it on the page. And then when you flip the page, it's got the next day's reading. And it also includes um, just a little thought and a challenge or a question to think about for each day also. So that's the schedule that we're following along as we go through. Make and sense? It's so fun that it's just all of us reading our little scriptures together. Same I know. I like, I, it's so funny because I've been a little bit sick and I've been so anxious to like jump on like stories or something. And just be like, are, are, is, is everyone in it? Are we all ready to go? Just because we recorded before the start of the new year. So it'd just be up and ready. And then now everybody else is in the new year too. And so I was like, wanted to be excited with everybody. Instead, I was wanting to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine, everyone. Yeah. So, it's a great start to the new year. Woo. Yeah, if there's any wheezy <laughs> in today's episode or anything, or if I sound like Rudolph, you know, the claymation Rudolph, when they put oh, the little, like, when did you know, you when they Rudolph put the clay on his nose and he's so, it's when, did I, right when did I hear that? That's how I sound. So, all right. All right. Day number one's reading is going to be um, chapter six, first Nephi six, all of six, and then the first couple verses of chapter seven. We go up to verse eight in, in there. So six is right after they've gotten the brass plates. They've gone back and they've gotten them. And Lehi has spent a little bit of time just reading through them and making prophecies about um, and talking about their descendants. And Nephi starts in six and he says, verse one, I'm not going to give a full genealogy of my fathers in this part of the record. In fact, I never am going to <laughs> on this version <laughs> of the plates. And he said, that is going to be in the record which my father keeps. And I'm not going to put it in here. I do want to mention, he says in verse 2, that we are descendants of Joseph. And he said in verse 3, he says, It matters not to me that I am particular to give a full account of the things of my father, for they can be found on the other plates. I desire the room that I may write the things of God. And you start to figure out what he's filtering through. Um, just like there's not unlimited amount of space on the plates, each of us don't have unlimited time and we don't have unlimited words and we don't have unlimited interactions with people. And he says, the fullness of mine intent is that I may persuade men to come unto the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and be saved. And it makes me think about the use of my time and the use of my words and the use of my limited interactions that I have with people. And it makes me want to be a little bit more deliberate in having an intention. Sometimes I just let um, interactions happen as they will. And, and that is probably fine to some extent, but it did reading this make me want to think, what is your purpose, David? What is your intent in your time together with people? 
How do you want to leave them? What do you want to leave them remembering and thinking? I, 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 have, a lim- I have a limited amount of years with kids at home. You might have a limited amount of time in, in a conversation. And, and it's, I think, neat to think about what your intent may be. And I, I want to borrow Nephi's, uh, particularly that word to persuade people to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to be saved. Um, before we go on to that next slide, I, I want to think about that word saved, and I have it highlighted in here. Um, oh, and look, you guys, I have my little book that my friend gave me that this is the one I'm going to be carrying it's around. It's so, so cute. <laughs> Why is it so cute to have a little book of one? I know that you just want to, if you miss one of the beginning lessons, we kind of talked about, does anybody want to just carry one around with them everywhere that, that they go? And I underlined that word and be saved and wrote some other words. And you might write something in your margin as well, where he says, I want to persuade people to come unto the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be healed, to come unto him and be redeemed, to come unto him and be restored, to come unto him and be loved. I know what he has to offer people because I know what he has had to offer me. And that might be why I want to persuade people to come unto him. Now, one other thing in this chapter that I want to point out is there he uses a name of Jesus that you're going to find throughout all of the Book of Mormon, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In one sense, when you read that title, that is a covenant title. Um, God makes covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the intent in the beginning of this book is, is to remind people that he is a God of covenant and that you're not cast off forever, that he's going to fulfill his promises. And so when you read those, that will be code language for a God of covenant. You can read it like that every single time. But one other way you might read that is um, when he says, I'm the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, you may want to remember their stories and remember what kind of God that is. So here on this next slide, Uh, We put here for you the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the chapters that you could go learn their stories. If you are interested this week in doing a little bit of an extra study, like what was, remind me what their story was. Um, You might come away with conclusions like this on this side. You may remember in the story of Abraham that you find in Genesis 12 through 22, that God promises Abraham impossible things, and then he fulfills them. He finds a way to make it come to pass. And so whenever you read the phrase God of Abraham, you might think to yourself, oh, he is a God who fulfills impossible promises. Or if you review Isaac's story, you may remember, oh, he was a God of great blessing for him. But his most famous story is that he was a God of rescue for Isaac. And in Jacob's story, you may remember that God at the beginning, when we studied Jacob's story altogether, that he was a God who kept with Jacob. That he was a, um, that despite Jacob's mistakes, despite Jacob trying to take the bull by the horns, um, God kept with him. And, and, and we could see that God is a God of second chances in the story of Jacob. So when you hear that phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you could also substitute that by a phrase, the God of impossible promises, the God of rescue, and the God of second chances. And, and yeah, go ahead. No, well, and I feel like it makes it actually more powerful, the entire verse together, because you mentioned the part that it says like, and be saved. I want to persuade you of him because I know what he can do. And I never even realized that it almost like shows you his thought pattern in the sense that he's like, I have read these stories. I have learned what God can do. Mm-hmm. And I know he can save you because of the, like the God I've read about in these stories. And it's so exciting to me to think we have more books with more stories. Yeah. And if I want to know what God can do, I have books and books and books that I can go through and read and think, oh, I actually know God can do this because of the stories I've read. Yeah. And we're going to see that. In fact, in the very last section of it, when we get to chapter 10, here's a little spoiler, a bookend, is that he's going to promise he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. And... Someone like Nephi could look to the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and say, if God does that for them, then I'm going to expect and anticipate that he's going to be that same kind of God 
for me. And that's who I want to persuade people to come unto. Come unto this God of impossible promises. Come unto this God of rescue. A couple of verses back, he mentioned, it suffices me to say that we're descendants of Joseph. You could now fill in a new name and title for God. The God of Joseph is a God who, fill in the blank there, carries you through your story all the way to the end. Um, and then as we read throughout the entire Book of Mormon this year, I think it, Nephi says, I, for me, and I'm going to give a commandment, he says, to my seed in verse 6, anybody who writes anything on, this, on these plates, persuade people to come unto God by sharing your story. Teach them who God is in your particular story. And as we turn the pages of this, we're going to start learning who is the God of Lehi? Who's the God of Sariah? Who's the God of Alma, the elder and the younger? Who's the God of Samuel, the Lamanite? Who's the God of Abish? And we're going to continue to be able to add to this list of who God is and particularly the kind of God that we could anticipate and look forward to and the God that we might persuade other people to come unto also. Because if they do, they can be saved or receive promise or be rescued or live a life of second chances. And, and that is what, that's what we're inviting people into. That's who we're inviting people into relationship with. I also think it's so special. This is on page 12 of the Book of Mormon, okay? Early, early on. And I love that on page 12, he is going to make this the most relevant book of all time. He's mm -hmm. going to say, listen, this is not a waste of time. There's not going to be fluff in here. There's not going to be filler. I'm going to make sure that this book is only full of the most important things. Yeah. And I think that's such a thrill to begin this book and realize, actually, that means that every single page on here has something that Nephi said, this is actually of worth. Mm -hmm. This is of value. Yeah. Every page is not full of fluff and filler, and there's not parts you're going to want to skip because all of it is going to be valuable. Yeah, and the greatest value of all, he says, is to persuade people to come unto this God and be saved. Let him intervene in your life. Now, as you get into chapter 7, let me just get into it, and then we'll go into the next because it just includes the first couple verses. There's something you might want to highlight in verse 1 and in verse 2 and then in verse 3, and it's the word again. And we are learning that the God of the family of Lehi is a God who speaks again, a God who is involved again, that he was involved in this page, but you can anticipate him being involved in the next page because he's going to send, he's going to come to Lehi again and say, I'm going to improve your life once more. This time, go back to Jerusalem again, and I want you to get um, wives <laughs> and another family to come with you. You're not going to like to be on this journey all by yourself. And so you, we start to get into that journey of them going back to Jerusalem. And I just like reading it as a story of God still involved. And, and, and he doesn't want you to be miserable. Yes. Like, they could have done the journey alone. Right. They for sure could have. Like, maybe, maybe not. It would have been harder. But I love that God looks at them and says, no, actually, I'm not a God that wants to punish you. Yes. I actually want to make your life better. And my intentions with you are multi-generational. So you're going to need for the seed to continue because I, I, I do have great purposes for your individual lives. But the way I see what I see and where I'm going is, is, yes, involved in your day to day, but I see hundreds and thousands of years into the future also. And to prepare for that, I, I'm going to need you to go get um, families to, to come with you because my purposes are not just for the next 50 years. They will include the next 5,000. Which is so exciting. Yeah. Day two's reading starts in sec in First Nephi. Chapter 7, verses 8 through 22. And it's just right... just be going and I'm flipping the page. Okay, <laughs> and it's going to happen right after they find the, their wives. They start going back. And it's so interesting to me because Laman and Lemuel's journey, we typically see like bad parts and that's what we focus on. And we don't ever unpack the reason why. But it's so interesting to me that they actually had to go back to their homes and see their homes. Like they went back to their city they grew up in and it was fine. It wasn't destroyed. Like it was just exactly how they left it. And then we're like, oh, they, why didn't they just want to go in the wilderness? Why didn't? They went back and had to re-see that. Mm. Of course they wanted to go back. 
Because what's going to happen in verse 7 is it says, And it came to pass in the witch rebellion, after they had gotten their wives, they'd all gone, they're going back to the wilderness. They were desirous to return unto the land of Jerusalem. And we want to say, why? Like, they just be faithful, just be obedient. Well, they just looked at what they walked away from and had to walk away from it again. That's hard. That's a hard place to be in. And it's so interesting because Nephi's response is a reminder of, like, it's this beautiful part where all of a sudden Nephi's like, listen, you need actually a reminder. You don't need to go back. You need a reminder. You forgot. That's the problem here. And that, first of all, that's the most me. You guys, I can't even go to the airport without writing like, don't forget your ID on my hand. That's the only thing you need when you travel. And I'm like, <laughs> I have to write that on my hand. And so it's like, we're going to get into this point and we want to look at Laman and Lemuel and be like, you're so dumb. Why did you do that? It's not even that hard. I can't even bring my ID to the airport. That is not hard, you guys. And now all of a sudden Nephi is going to be like, listen, how is it that you have not hearkened unto the word of the Lord? Verse 10, how is it that you have forgotten? That's where this starts. Nephi is like, you actually forgot. You just went home and you were reminded what you walked away from. But let me actually remind you of what you have forgotten that has happened since you left. How is it that you have forgotten that the Lord, that ye have seen an angel of the Lord? Did you forget about the angel when you went home and you saw your house and your old friends? Verse 11, yea, and how is it that you have forgotten the great things the Lord has done for us in delivering us out of the hands of Laban and also that we should obtain the record? Did you forget that the miracle that we just lived through, that we did something almost seemingly impossible and it worked because of God? Did you forget about that? Yea, how is it that you have forgotten that the Lord is able to do all things according to his will for the children of men, if it so be that they exercise faith in him? Did you forget about the miracles? Did you forget about the good things? Did you forget the reason we left? Mm. And then this part is so powerful. Wherefore, let us be faithful to him. Not let us be faithful to the commandments. Not let us be faithful to any of that. That was all second tier. That would all happen if they were faithful to him. The God that actually delivered him. That was worth it. That's worth walking away from everything from multiple times after they went back. And it's so interesting because their response isn't like, oh yeah, you're right. I remember the miracles. I remember the great things. They actually get super, super angry. And they're like, wait a minute. Like, I actually am still mad that we had to leave. And I get that the destruction is supposed to happen and all of this is supposed to happen. But I'm actually mad. In verse 16, they're so angry with Nephi for trying to remind them of who God is that um, they did bind him with cords for they sought to take away his life that they might leave me in the wilderness to be devoured by wild beasts. It wasn't that they were just like, oh my gosh, Nephi, stop talking. They were just absolutely full of anger, mm. just completely, completely mad. And then in verse 17, you start to learn something about Nephi that might just be the difference between Laman and Lemuel and Nephi. And all of a sudden he's going to say, I prayed unto the Lord, which we should stop right there and think about the fact that praying was actually Nephi's first instinct. When his life was on the line, the first thing he wanted to do was pray. Maybe that was out of desperation. Maybe that's because of the God he knew. Mm. That he said, oh, I've been trapped before. I've been stuck. My life has been like on the line before. I'm going to pray. And his prayer is, oh, Lord, according to my faith, which is in thee, the God who saved me multiple times, even just in this journey, even 12 pages in, the God, my faith is in the God that saved me. Wilt thou deliver me from the hands of my brother? When he asks in verse 12, wherefore let us be faithful in him, when he says, listen, we have to have faith in God. The God he's faithful to is the one that has delivered him time and time again and will never stop delivering him. It's interesting to me that in chapter six, he said, it sufficeth me to just remind you and say, I'm a descendant of Joseph. So he clearly knows a story of a younger brother who is bullied oh, <laughs> by older brothers. And I've just never thought about that before. There here he is just coming off of a reminder of that story uh, and this younger brother of promise um, who's having to deal with older brothers who can't quite capture the vision yet and may, how much he must identify with Joseph of Egypt particularly in, the, I mean, he's being tied up 
and yeah. one left for wild beasts. That's the exact same story of Joseph of Egypt. And, and just, it makes me just think what's going through his head right now. Is he thinking, you know, is my story going to look like his? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, is oh. a caravan coming? Is, you know, but he has other promises that he's holding on to. But anyways, I've just never thought about that before until right now. And it's so cool that he also needed a God that would deliver him multiple times. Yeah. It right. wasn't just the one time. And God's going to show up. And it says in verse 18, And it came to pass that when I had said these words, behold, the bands were loosed from off my hands and feet. And I stood before my brethren, and I spake unto them again. And he says, And it came to pass that they were angry with me again and sought to lay hands on me. But behold, one of the daughters of Ishmael and also her mother and one of the sons of Ishmael did plead with my brethren in so much that they did soften their hearts and they did see striving to take away my life. And they were so- sorrowful because of their wickedness. They bowed down before me and did plead with me that I would forgive them. And this part is so tender to me in verse 21. And it came to pass that I did frankly forgive. That's it. I frankly forgave them for all that they had done. And I prayed unto the Lord God for forgiveness, for their forgiveness. And it's so interesting to me because all they actually needed in that moment was a reminder. And Nephi's deliverance actually gave them that reminder. And you only need a reminder if you have forgotten. Mm. Nephi knew that. He said, you forgot the great things. You forgot that God had showed up. And once they remembered that God showed up, their hearts actually were softened. And it makes me think, maybe I need to be a little bit more proactive in my remembering. Hmm. Maybe in the moments that I'm tied up, maybe in the moments that I'm angry at what God's asking me to do, maybe in the moments that I am frustrated, rather than trying to move forward, maybe I need to look back. And I need to think, when has God showed up for me? When has he been the one that saved me? Hmm. When has he already showed up in my story? Can I remember those moments? You know, Mm -hmm. and it's so tender to me because at the very end, when they all get back, it says what Laman and Lemuel do. And I think it might be the answer to anger because they started out so angry that they tied their brother up. They wanted to leave him to beasts. And by verse 22, it says that they did give thanks unto the Lord God, the Lord, their God. And they did offer sacrifice and burnt offerings unto him. The answer to their anger was actually gratitude. Mm. It doesn't seem like they would be the type of people that wanted to offer gratitude. And I love that they did. After a moment of anger, what solved that was actually great, being grateful and gratitude. Yeah, I, when I read this, I wrote just in, you know, in my journal when I was studying it along. Because there's this question. And the journal, this journal, by the way, um, is awesome for personal study that it's got these questions in it every single week that kind of help you dig and deepen your understanding and thoughts about the story as you go through. And then it's got a worksheet for families also, and we'll get to that. But this one lists some of the great things that God has done in your own life. And if we go over one spot, this is our poster for the week. Our word of the week is deliver. It comes from first Nephi seven seventeen. O Lord, according to my faith, which in thee wilt thou deliver me? And I love thinking so far how all of the different ways, this is the question I meant to point to. <laughs> I, read, I put, read question two, but I meant question three in here. The different ways that God has delivered so far. And he delivered Nephi by um, loosening the bands, which isn't that interesting that he asked, will you give me strength to break them? And then God did it. And then God did it. And he, he let me loosen them. And already I've got two things. Sometimes he'll give you the strength to overcome. Sometimes he will loosen. Um, Nephi mentioned a few. We were delivered by an angel. The plates were delivered into our hands. We were delivered out of the hands of Laban. We were delivered out of Jerusalem. We were delivered from loneliness in the wilderness by being given this family willing to be crazy enough to come on the journey with us. You can start listing already seven chapters into the Book of Mormon, just the different ways that God... Um, has been a deliverer for them. And Nephi is trying to remind Laman and Lemuel of a delivering God. Don't you you remember he did this and he did this and he did this? Your, Your mind is focused on what you've lost. Let me give you something else to focus your mind and heart on. And none of it worked, but Laman and Lemuel were actually delivered by the, the words and the tenderness of this other family. That it was when they came in. And I just like seeing this God who's 
working all of the different angles with him. How, how am I going to, listen, it might not be an angel that works <laughs> for you, but um, maybe these friends of yours will. Yeah. You know, these cute girls in this particular <laughs> instance, maybe we can get them to say something and that's going to grab your attention. So I like thinking about that, that question and this word, what are the different ways? And this might be something you would do together with a family, you know, at, at, at the beginning of the week and talk about, let's look all week long for the different ways that God um, delivers us. And we can talk about it, what we see in here, but then, you know, how is he, what different angles is he coming into our stories with. That he'll do it over and over and over again. Yeah. He never stops being the deliverer. Right. Right. No matter whose fault it is too. Yeah. Right. He's going to deliver Nephi. Wasn't his fault. And he's going to deliver Laman and Lemuel. And in this story, it was theirs. And I love that when you need a deliverer, you can actually just look back. And Mm. he'll prove that he was one. Right. And he will be again. Yes. 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 Super awesome. Okay, the next day's reading is going to be 1st Nephi chapter 8, um, the first half, and then we're going to have the second half is going to be the, um, the next day's reading. So chapter 8 is going to be divided into two different days of reading. This is probably one of the most famous sections in the Book of Mormon, um, and it's going to carry a theme throughout the entire Book of Mormon. If you pay attention, you're going to see that a lot of future writers in the Book of Mormon and a lot of prophets and stories are going to refer back to what happens in 1 Nephi chapter 8. Um, the whole family, generations down the, down the way, are going to like really cling onto this dream that Lehi has. Um, before we jump into the dream, um, each week we've got, uh, we have this Tender Mercies poster. This is what I was going to tell you at the very beginning, and then I said, hold on, I'll tell you when we get there, it'll be better. Um, this is called the Mercies of the Lord poster. <coughs> You can get it in our newsletter for free, and then you just send it to a copy shop of uh, whoever to print it out. You have two parts to it. One, this big poster, and then second, the pieces that go on, because every week we're keeping track of different mercies of the Lord, or to kind of follow the theme of today, the different ways that God delivers. And one of the things that he does for them is, uh, we have for this week, is uh, dreams that that is one of the ways that God will intervene, that God will instruct, that God will inspire um, us and others is through dreams. And he gives this particular dream to Lehi that what a gift. (laughs) I wonder if Lehi has any idea um, the impact that that one particular dream has had on now millions of different people and giving them um, answers and giving them hope and giving them um, instruction as they live their particular lives. So if you've never, so we put that one on there. That's the one for this week is this um, dream. Now it's interesting because this dream happens, you know, in a wilderness and Lehi's in a wilderness, but it's a dream that um, anybody who reads it can find themselves in. And we're going to get it one time right now. And then next week we're going to get the vision Um, again, a second time with Nephi. But first we have Lehi who dreams this dream. And some of you are already familiar with what's going to happen in the dream. So let me just tell you this before we jump into it. It's, it almost has these two parts to it where first you get one person who lives this dream individually, and then it expands and shows you that this can be every person's dream. Um, You get the story of one, Lehi, and then you, when it gets repeated, you get now multitudes of people and you just think to yourself that each of them are experiencing what that one person experienced when we went through it the very first time. So Nephi talks about being, he says, I have dreamed this dream. This is chapter eight, verse two, or in other words, I've seen a vision And because of the thing which I've seen, I have reason to rejoice in the Lord because of Nephi and Sam. For I have reason to suppose that they, along with many of their seed, will be saved. But behold, Laman and Lemuel, I fear exceedingly because of you. For behold, I thought I saw in my dream a dark and dreary wilderness. And it came to pass, I saw a man, and he was dressed in a white robe, and he came and he stood before me, and and it came to pass that he spake unto me and bade me that I should follow him. 
And I'm just thinking to myself for a second, consider some of the words that Nephi is experiencing where he says, I was in a dark place. I was in a dreary place. I was in a wilderness place. And in verse seven, he's going to add another word. He was like, I was in a waste place. And this is where it's, it becomes, everybody can see or has partic- has been a part of, of some time in their life where they felt like a dark or they felt dreariness, or they felt waste, or they felt wilderness. I just, I have, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I feel lost. I feel confused. I feel chaos. I feel all of these things. And God sends this angel in verse five for him to follow. And he follows, he says, for many hours in the darkness, which Another phrase that you might underline, because you might relate to the fact that I, for a long time, I felt confused and directionless. And then he says, I began to pray unto the Lord, and we might add a delivering Lord, that he would have mercy on me according to the multitude of his tender mercies. That he cries out, I love in this dream, he knows where he can go to for strength and where he can go to for help. And he does. And the answer to that is he finds himself in a large and spacious field. So now like a cultivated field, which is the opposite of where he was in this dark and dreary like wasteland. Now it's like, oh, now you're in a field, a farmland almost. And in the middle of it, there's a tree whose fruit was desirable to make one happy. And it was a white tree. He keeps mentioning that the fruit on it was white, which makes me think that it was glowing. And a lot of our art depictions of, that was like a Southern depictions um, (laughs) of that tree are of it glowing, which I like to think it was, if it was, he's going to call it bright and white, which is in direct response to the fact that he was in a dark and which, which way should I go? Which direction should, should I, um, um, head toward. And he says in 11, I went and I partook the fruit of that tree and it was the most sweet above all that I'd ever tasted. And it was white to exceed all the whiteness that I had ever seen. And verse 12, it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. And you get this tree, which is the answer to uh, now better to the eyes than anything else, better to the taste than anything else. Um, a solution. He's no longer wandering or lost anymore. So you see that the essence of this vision or this dream that he has is to any that feel lost or any that feel dreary or any that feel like their life is a waste or any that feel scared or worried, there is an answer to it. And in this, in this particular dream, it is this, this tree and, and then he partakes of that. And the first thing he wants to do is share it with the rest of his family because he knows surely they are experiencing the same kind of confusion and loss and worry and wonder in their life. That is one thing that is common to the human condition is that all of us will experience some sort of lack or some sort of lostness. And Lehi has found the solution to it, and he wants to offer it to them. And I think that is really powerful, is what he's going to offer to everybody is the experience that he had with with God um, as the solution. I just like that he's not going to like necessarily say, I know the tree is true, but rather he's going to say, this is what it did for me. I tasted it. I experienced it. I participated in the fruits of relationship with God. And this is what changed. And this is what is now different. He can almost say like that blind boy in John chapter nine, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I experienced the dark, the dreariness and the waste and the lostness. And now I've experienced what it means to be fulfilled, to, to, have, to have been captured, to have been found, to have been redeemed, and to have been rescued. And that's what he wants to share. And it's then the dreams can expand in this next section to show like multitudes of people 
with multitudes of problems. And the dream is going to make it really simple as to say, those who are lost or in darkness or in loss or in confusion, there is a simple solution. And it's better than anything else that the world has to offer. It's the best of the best. And he didn't want to just tell them that. He actually wanted them to experience it. Which I think people need to because yes. he did. I ex right. Nobody told me about it. No. The angel led me to it and said, eat it. Well, I mean, he didn't say it. He's going to say it in Nephi's vision. So I'm <laughs> assuming maybe something happens there, right? Where he says, here, I'm going to take you to this. You experience it for yourself. Watch the darkness gets swallowed. I mean, he's not even going to mention it anymore after that. Yeah. And he's not going to force feed it to him. And he's not going to just like describe his experience. He's like, no, actually, you have got to get here. Yeah. Let me, like, the, I want you to experience the goodness and the satisfaction and the fullness. What just happened to me? Yes, yes. Now, you could use this worksheet that's in here. And you, we're going to introduce it right now so you can see this. Um, two things to introduce right now in this first half. Um, one is this worksheet. And up at the very top of the worksheet, we have this line. For every tactic of the adversary, there is an answer from the Lord. And that's the essence of this vision. Is that he is going to try and blind us and lead us away. And he's going to try and discourage us. And he's going to try and just um, confuse and... and um, all the above, any word that you can think of that's a synonym to that. And you can see in this vision that the Lord is giving an answer to all of those things. In a grand sense, you almost get this idea of the fall and redemption. That's what this is a story of. Every problem of fallenness, God is redeeming through his son. Now I'm cheating a little bit. For those of you who are like, you're going, how do you know that that's his son? Well, even though it might make sense with saying, like, oh, it's because it's life-giving and it's fruit and it's sweet, you know, we can make that assumption. But we have the tip in for that you can slide into this chapter, 1 Nephi 8, and it gives you the different symbols. Because we are reading this vision just in symbolic form right now, which I think is is great. It just now speaks to every situation. Um, and you a can be curious in it, which is cool. Right. It's like almost like, what do you think about the dream? Right, right. Yeah. And I like just like reading it for my first time and saying, what's happening just in simple essence mm -hmm. here? Um, and that, But in a couple chapters, Nephi is going to ask for interpretations of the different parts of, uh, of the dream. Um, and, and we've included those on this tip in. So what you find in chapter 8 and 11 and then their interpretations, that's on this particular tip in. And so you can slide that in 1 Nephi chapter 8 for when you read it, or you can slide it into 1 Nephi 11 next time. You can kind of have a, um, a choice there. But as you go through, you've got that just to slide in your scriptures, but you have, might want to work through some of this and see and talk about what do you think that dark wilderness represents? And what do you think that river represents? And what do you think that mist that blinds everybody represents. And then there's more parts to the dream that Grace is going to cover in the next day's reading, what they represent, but then also to spend some time saying, and what did God do to compensate for that particular tactic of either mortality or the adversary himself, right? What, what is it that he gave as a, as a solution or an answer, right? Lehi had a problem. He prayed for help and God gave him an answer and a solution. It is a story of loss and redemption. That's what the tree of life is. It's the essence of our, our entire journey on the earth. And that's why I think later prophets are going to relate so well to it and use some of the same language. And this can be any person's dream or experience because we all will experience things on the left side of this. And then God is offering deliverance through multiple different ways. It's kind of cool that like just through different symbols, yeah, to see it all laid out through different symbols because it just kind of teaches that God will reach into individual different stories and in individual different ways to deliver and, and to rescue. 
And to see that God's working as hard as he possibly can to save you. Yeah. Like over and over and over. Right. However he can. He's going to do anything he can possible. Right, right, right. So that you can fill out with the first and second half of chapter eight as, as you move through it. There's a couple spots on the bottom, six, seven, and eight, where we didn't give things. One, because we thought, well, what if we forgot something that you see in there as a tactic of the adversary or a solution of the Lord that we didn't particularly see, but then also left them a little bit blank too to consider, is there some particular tactic of the adversary you're noticing in your life and what is or has been God's solution for um, for you? Maybe something specific that you don't find in here, but you do see in your own story playing out. Which is so fun. Okay, the next day's reading is going to be in 1 Nephi 8. It's going to start in the middle of the chapter. So verse 16 is where it begins. And Lehi has this moment where he sees his family and they have an experience and he sees Nephi and all of the kids and all of these things. But what's going to happen is he's going to start seeing the rest of the vision right now. And he see like, it's almost like big picture zoom out. Let me see what's actually going on here. And what is going to happen is um, he's going to begin to see Laman and Lemuel and they decide not to go. They're like, I, they don't want to take the journey to the tree. And that is in verse 18. And by verse 19, you start to get the zoom out picture. And it says, And I beheld a rod of iron, and it extended um, along the bank of the river and led to the tree by which I stood. And I also beheld a straight and narrow path which came along the rod of iron, even to the tree by which I stood. And it also led by the head of the fountain unto a large and spacious field as if it had been a world. All of a sudden you get big picture. You see ginormous field, the whole world. You see a path and you see a rod all leading to the tree. But what I think is the most important, you can look at the objects and I think you can see all of these things, but there's something about the people to me that seems super important. That he's going to describe the environment But maybe it's because I'm a person, so I feel like that is why I just want to see where I'm at. But what's going to happen now is he's going to unpack the people. And he's going to say, let me show you who's here. And so that is going to happen in verse 21. And I saw numerous, numberless courses. What is happening, you guys? I can't even read. I saw numberless concourses of people, many of whom were pressing forward that they might obtain the path. They wanted to find it too. And it came to pass that they did come forth and commence in the path which led to the tree. These people began a journey. Yeah, and it just makes me wonder, with each of these people, they're pressing forward that they are looking for something. There's something in each of them that's like, I'm, I'm looking for something different. And I, I was um, I stumbled across, um, so Blaise Pascal, who's the philosopher, French philosopher, used this phrase once where he says, there is a God-shaped hole inside every person's soul. And they're looking for it to be filled. They're looking for it to be satisfied, but it's a God-shaped one. And so only God can fill it. And you almost see here these people pressing forward because they have some particular lack or some hole that they feel in them. Everybody does. And they're pressing to try and find what, what can solve it. Reminds me of the woman at the well. It's just like where Jesus says, if you drink that water, you'll thirst again. And again and again, no matter how many wells you go to, you'll always come away from them with that. Your thirst hasn't been slacked. But if you'll drink of the water that I give you, it will well up in you as a fountain that that never runs dry. And, And it almost, you almost, that phrase pressing forward makes me feel like, you just the people from every place and time period and circumstance like yearning for something that's missing in them and it's so interesting that everyone's journey started there i think with a need yeah yeah, sometimes we only see the end of their story and we're like oh my gosh like what what was their problem and i'm like wait 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 everyone started with a need Everyone started looking for something. Yeah. And it's even more interesting because the first group, so what happens in verse 23 is it came to pass that there arose a mist of darkness, yet even an exceedingly great mist of darkness, insomuch that they who had started commenced in the path did lose their way. 
they did not not want the path anymore. They actually got lost. Yeah. It was not on purpose that they got lost. It was like the mist came and they got so confused. And this is a world that is easy to wander in and it's a world that's yes. easy to get lost in. Yes. There's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of voices calling us. There's a lot of solutions to, to you know. Um, yes. Elder, um, I know we're about to get to the building, which we haven't gotten to yet. But let me just say this. Well, yeah, I'll just say it right now. A building's coming, everybody. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> you, you don't know, but Elder Packer, I remember him saying in that one talk that he gave on the Tree of Life vision, he says that now that building has moved itself onto the path because of the, we live in a world of social media and, and technology now where it's just right in front of us, all of these different voices and solutions that are distracting for us, it just is, it, it's right in our living rooms. It's not off in the distance anymore. It's just, it's moved itself right here. Which is even so interesting with mist because mist actually surrounds you. Right. You only notice mist if it is in your way. Yeah. If it is like absolutely surrounding you. I don't care if there's mist on the mountains. I have no idea. You can't, like, I can't see it from here. Yeah. But when it is on top of you, that's when the problems start, you know? Yeah. And that's what all of a sudden these people, they were launder, they wandered and they were lost. And it wasn't on purpose, but that's just what happened on their journey. Yeah. And it's so interesting because he sees more and more people. And it came to pass that I beheld others pressing forward. And they came forth and caught hold of the end of the rod. They started on this path. They grabbed it and they did press forward through the mist of darkness, clinging to the rod of iron, even until they did come forth and partake of the fruit of the tree. They got there. They made it. They clung on the entire way through the journey. They did it. You're so proud of them. You're like, oh my goodness, good, great. They figured it out. But then something happens. And after they had partaken of the fruit of the tree, they did cast their eyes about as if they were ashamed. Hmm. Their response after they had tasted of the goodness, all of the things that Lehi described, it was the same fruit. But their response after, rather than looking around for the people they wanted to bring, was actually looking around in shame. Hmm. and embarrassment and fear. And it's so interesting because you can almost hear Lehi's thoughts that he's like, why? What, why did you respond different than me? Why did you look around ashamed when I looked around to help? And it's like all of a sudden the picture grows bigger. And I cast my eyes round about and beheld on the other side of the river of water, a great and spacious building. And it stood above as if it were in the air, high above the earth. And it was filled with people, both old and young, both male and female, and their manner of dress was exceedingly fine. And they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers towards those who had come, come at and were partaking of the fruit. All of a sudden he realized their response. He said, wait, 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 you actually cared more about what the people in the building thought than you did about your experience. You looked around. You didn't care about your experience because your eyes were looking everywhere else. And this is the building that obviously David was talking about. And it's so interesting because you see the people, they get the fruit. That's another group. But I think sometimes we forget about the group that's in the building. They're also people too mm -hmm. in the building already. And one time... You guys are all going to wonder where this was. And you guys, I don't even have any remembrance of it. But my mom just texted me and said, hey, meet here. And it was like this garage in the back of someone's house. And it was ginormous. And they had made like a walkthrough version of this dream. And it was so, so cool. And it was like the first time that this dream really came to life for me because it actually did, you know. And you could walk yeah. around the whole entire thing like three-dimensional. And it was incredible. And what happened is as we were walking through, the path takes you behind the building. And the trees at the top of this hill and you go behind this building and you see all the people in the building. But the thing that was the most interesting to me were actually the windows. Because if the people at the tree could see the people in the building, there had to be windows, right? right. Because they could see the people in the building. But I had never thought about what this vision looked like if you were in the building. And all of those people in the building actually could see the tree and the path and the people on the path. And I think sometimes we forget that, yeah, actually sometimes in my journey of life, I am in the building. Sometimes I get tricked. Sometimes the mist takes me there. Sometimes I end up pointing and mocking. And I love that even in this dream, the people in the building have hope. Mm -hmm. They are looking at people experiencing him. They still see him. 
they can still get out. There's like still like a wait. I actually see something good on the yeah. other side. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. their vision isn't trapped there. And um, what happens is all of a sudden the people taste the fruit. They're ashamed. They see the people in the building um, and they actually fall away into forbidden paths and they are lost again. Um, their story starts exactly, their story finishes exactly how it started, lost and wandering. But then we get another group of people in verse 30. And they catch hold of the end of the iron rod and they did press their way forward, continually holding fast to the rod of iron, which it almost feels like we've seen people do before, but then here is a big difference. Until they came forth and fell down and partook of the fruit of the tree. Something changed when they experienced the tree. Something changed when they experienced that goodness. Once they finally made it, their response was actually falling down, which instantly to me reminds me of worship, reminds me of this moment that their hearts had that said, I just went on a journey. I just discovered something. I've just finally made it here. And I am so thankful. I am so grateful i am so full that i can't even stand up on my own anymore mm. and all of a sudden when the tree isn't a tree anymore and it's a person and this person like and the individual's response to finally getting to this person is falling down at their feet you see the difference in the heart they couldn't have cared less about what was around them because all they could think about was worshiping the person they had just discovered, the tree, the fruit, the goodness, you know? Yeah, it's like their heart was captured by something. It was compelled by something. It just, like you were saying, when that, that imagery of falling down at the tree, and you just think to yourself, what emotion causes somebody to fall down? And, and, and then you start to maybe get a peek into these people's heart a little bit. And they fell down when they got to the tree, which makes me think, you must have come to know who he was along the way. And then you start realizing that he's called the word and he's called the path and he's called that he was there every step of the way for these people. And when they get there and they partake of redemption, they fall, you know? And they already knew him. Yes, right, right. And there's a sense of like gratitude. And I like that earlier you had said that because as you were just reading through this, it made me think about Laman and Lemuel in the earlier part in chapter seven, that the antithesis to, you know, that the, just whatever they were experiencing, forgetting was, would have been gratitude hmm. that they were living out that vision of the tree in chapter seven before Lehi ever has it. And, and it's like, Oh, be captured by the delivering God. Be ca like, w let your heart like, swell with gratitude for redemption, for rescue, for filling that God-shaped hole that is in you instead of all of these you know, other things that have, have the ability. It's interesting, the commentary in humanity of how influenced we can be by somebody else. And, and that this vision says, but be influenced and be captured by the goodness of, of God. Let your heart fall you know, at, at his feet, like be redeemed, be loved, be healed, you know, be rescued by him. And know him. Yeah. The more you know him, it's so much easier to fall down. You can't help it. Right. He's just that good. Yes. He's that good of a God. Yeah. And I, um, I like that where you were saying, um, when the vision ends at the very end of this, that Lehi, it says in 37, he oh, did exhort... Oh, I'm so happy you're going to talk about this. Hurry, go. That he did exhort thing. them with all the feeling of a tender parent, that they would hearken unto his words, that perhaps the Lord would be merciful to them and not cast them off. I just like that it just shows what exactly what we were saying, that he sees them in the building where the vision ends and Lehi knows, but you don't have to stay there. I, I, um, those who partake of... I, just in the... Where's that? In the thing right here, the worksheet, where it said one thing is people, people can draw us away, you know, the people in the building. But the solution to that is other people who can draw you to the tree. And there was Lehi just begging them as, as a parent. There is something better, boys. There's something richer, something sweeter that you can taste and experience that 
that city we left behind, Jerusalem, and all those riches and, and, and whatever it is that you're after, there is something more fulfilling to the soul than anything else there is. And, and Nephi did the same thing in that chapter six. I'm, I wanna persuade people to come to the tree and I wanna persuade people to partake of its fruit and experience what it means to be found and experience what it is to see and, and be in relationship with, with God. And I just like that you keep seeing, yes, there's people in the building trying to pull away, but there are people at the tree trying to persuade and call others Um, to experience the same thing. And I love that he woke up and his response was tender. That he said, oh no, I'm going to introduce this to you with a tender tone. Yeah, it's so sweet. Okay, the next day's reading is just chapter 9. And it's really just a small chapter. And Nephi just says that there were lots of things that his father spoke about and and wrote about and heard and all of these things. And I I do love that it says in chapter nine, verse one, it happened in the valley while he dwelt in a tent. And I like that part because they are legit out in the middle of the Judean wilderness, living in a tent, a dot on the map. And they have no clue. Lehi has no clue that vision he just spoke of is now going to impact some um, little missionary boy from Texas serving in Korea in the year 2000. And he has no idea the different people that that vision and those words are going to reach. They are living in a tent, they're tent people. And I imagine that they may have um, believed about themselves that, that they weren't making much of a splash on the history of this world when in fact they absolutely were. And chapter nine is a testament to what God can do with our offerings. And Nephi tells you, he says, I'm, I have two sets of plates and on one, I'm gonna write a lot of history and the kings and the wars in chapter two that he says, but chap- verse three, he says, nevertheless, I received a commandment of the Lord. I should make these plates, these little plates, for a special purpose, that they should be an account engraven of the ministry of my people. So on verse four, on the other ones, I'm going to write this kind of stuff. But on these, verse five, the Lord hath commanded me to make these for a wise purpose in him, which purpose I know not. And this is just one domino in a series of them. One of them is going to be in words of Mormon. And then you're going to have to zoom ahead another uh, 2,400 years. Um, at least to get to the next domino to kind of see what God was doing with them at that particular time. And they had no idea. They had no clue the great purposes and work of God that he was, I would say they don't have clue, a clue of the work he's doing within them in that moment. And they certainly don't have a clue for what he's doing with their words and their experiences hundreds and even thousands of years later. And in chapter nine, I kind of put this together. All of these member always get put onto the app. So that anything, or you can just screenshot them, but if you want it to be easier, <laughs> but here you got me and him and Nephi is saying, I received his word and I followed through and look at, these are some of the words that I highlighted in chapter nine for God purpose wisdom, all knowledge, he says from the very beginning, that he prepares a way, that he accomplishes, that he fulfills. And then this is implied that he calls Nephi to participate in this. And I love reading this chapter, this little short chapter being 2000 years ahead. Chapter nine is awesome to look back and give me hope for my own story that God can do great purposes and I can participate in them. And I think that chapter nine is a, is a beautiful and powerful reminder of that. For me, one, I can believe it, that God is moving and working in these much bigger ways. And second, I can be a participant in it. And all it would take was, would, would be for me to receive his word and follow through. And I just love thinking that if you hold this book in your hands, 
or on your phone, in an app. If you have ever even opened it, it doesn't matter if it's been for three seconds or every single day for the past five years. I love that chapter nine is evidence that God had you in his mind already. Mm. He was already thinking about you. He actually was thinking about you thousands and thousands of years ago. He had you in his mind. Chapter Uh, nine proves it. That's so awesome. Yeah. And now just carry that belief forward into your next days and into your next weeks that he's been moving and working for your good and your benefit and your redemption for thousands of years and, and you've had no idea. And, and let that be true about your story. And then to also know if you'd like to participate in that great story and work, and, and you can also. And it would just be as simple as this. Listen and, and follow through. Believe it about yourself. And then if you're so inclined, um, jump in and be a part of it. Mm. Beautiful. The final reading of this is just going to be this week is all of chapter 10. And I think it speaks so much about this family that the comp- you get a sneak peek into the conversations they're having in the wilderness. Because that's what Nephi keeps writing about. And he actually just keeps writing down Lehi's moments with God. And I love thinking that their conversation in the wilderness is actually just them talking about their moments with God. Hmm. Because it's going to start out and it's going to say, listen, Lehi is going to tell us what he saw after the dream. He's going to tell us all about the dream, which would have been Lehi's experience with God. And then he's going to keep going. And um, he decides he's going to speak into them concerning the Jews that after they should be destroyed, even that great city Jerusalem and many be carried captive into Babylon. He's going to tell them, listen, Jerusalem that you know and love, there really is going to be destruction and there really is going to be captivity. That is true about life. And I think it honestly makes me want to stop for just a second and just think that's not unique to Jerusalem for Lehi and Nephi's family, but actually that is simply just mortality. There's going to be destruction, destruction of relationships, destruction of dreams, destruction of your hope. There's going to be captivity from addiction. There's going to be captivity in the shape of bad habits. There's going to be captivity that is just life in general. Mm -hmm. That's just true. And all of a sudden, he's going to give us, Lehi's like, let me tell you what the answer to destruction and captivity is. He already made a plan for that. Yet even 600 years from the time that my father left Jerusalem, a prophet would the Lord God raise up among the Jews, even a Messiah, or in other words, a savior of the world. You want to know the answer to destruction and captivity? It was the same for Nephi and Lehi and the Jews as it is for me right now today. A Messiah or in other words, a savior of the world. Yeah, in, in big scale and small scale. I like that in chapter 7, we got a deliverance of Nephi from his brothers. And then in chapter 10, you're getting now a what? Almost like the tree of life vision. Yeah. It's one person's story, but it's also Everyone. everybody's story as well. Yes. And he's going to go through and it's almost like you get a 10 verse glimpse into who Jesus is. He is going to introduce them to the life of Jesus. And I love that it is in the shape of a conversation in the wilderness. He's going to say, let me tell you who this Jesus guy is going to be. And all of a sudden he says, and he spake concerning the prophets, how a great number had testified of these things. This wasn't an unfamiliar story. They had heard he was going to come concerning this Messiah of whom he had spoken or this redeemer of the world. The person they had heard stories about was coming and this was going to be his story. Um, All mankind were lost and in a fallen state and ever would be saved. They should rely on this redeemer, this guy, the one who prophets had spoken about. And there's going to be one guy that's going to come. We know him as John the Baptist, and he's going to prepare the way for the Lord, the way for this Messiah. And he's going to come and he's going to know his job. He's going to understand that there is someone mightier than him, someone who is on the way. And I love that it says, whose shoes latch it. I am not worthy to unloose. I am not even worthy to touch the dirtiest part of that man. 
I, that is even too sacred for me. He is going to be so much better than me. I can't even touch the lowest part of him. He is going to be that good. And um, he's going to go through and it's going to say all of a sudden, Jesus is going to come. He is going to be baptized with water, even that he, the one who couldn't even untie his shoe, would baptize the Messiah with water. And after he had baptized the Messiah, he should behold and bear record that he had baptized the Lamb of God who should take away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God, the one who would be sacrificed. And then all of a sudden he's going to keep going and he's telling this story and he's going to say, he's going to go, he's going to spread the gospel. He's going to preach it among the Jews and also concerning the dwindling of the Jews and unbelief. And after they had slain the Messiah who should come and after he had been slain, he should rise from the dead and should make himself manifest by the Holy Ghost unto the Gentiles. He just gave you all of Jesus' life story in like five verses, which is wild to me. And then he's going to go through and he's going to finish the story. And he's going to say, listen, what's going to happen is everything is going to be compared to an olive tree. And there are going to be branches and groups that are broken off and should be scattered upon all the face of the earth. It is going to be spread everywhere. It's going to be all over the place. And we, wherefore, he said, it must needs be that we should be led with one accord into the land of promise unto the fulfilling of the word of the Lord. This is all his plan. And it's not just his plan for our family. This is part of a really big plan. And after the house of Israel should be scattered, oh, this part, they should be gathered together again. Everything that is lost and fallen away and disappeared and hard to find that should all be gathered together again. Mm. And the way it's going to be brought back, the thing that is going to bring this family, this scattered, these people, these branches, what is going to bring everything back should be, oh, this is in verse 14, Come is the knowledge of the true Messiah, their Lord and their Redeemer. This is his plan. It's Jesus. And it came in the form of one that would be baptized in water. But don't you forget that that is just like the beginning of the story. He actually is going to gather in everything that is lost. He will fix the destruction. The captive will be set free. The lost will be found all because of him. Yeah. And I think the invitation, I I love on this, the read it, live it calendar for that last day where it said, um, verse 17 This one thing has been true since the beginning of time. When we diligently seek God, we receive the gift of His Spirit. So seek diligently. Just that verse 18 that we had mentioned to earlier, it says, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world, if it so be that they repent and come unto Him. That the, the purposes that He has to save, to gather, to rescue, to heal, to redeem, to bring in um, the same God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Joseph, the God of Nephi, the God of Lehi. He has been moving and working in the story of mankind and our stories since the beginning of time. It, it, that's that's been his purpose all along from the very, very beginning. I love what you said about that. It's, this book is evidence. That chapter is evidence that he's working in your story to redeem you. And this has been true. This has been true. If you feel lost, if you feel in darkness, if you feel in dreariness, if you feel bound by cords on your hands, seek him. He is the answer. If you are looking for something to satisfy your thirst, seek Him. If you are in darkness and you need light, seek Him the way He's done it yesterday, today, and forever. He will still continue um, to do. And for those you know who aren't quite ready to seek Him, I, I like that forever part. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. But just in case you know someone who's not ready, He is the same tomorrow and forever. Also, he is a God who delivers. Over and over and over again. Yeah. Okay. So awesome. All right. We will see you next week for more good stuff.